Hi everyone, good morning. How are you guys doing? So um, I'm gonna get us started just so that we end on time because we're all about being on time in emergency medicine. I think that's really great. I'm Tina Chen, I'm from St. Louis University. I hope you're having a great time at SAM. I hope that the heat is treating you okay. So what we did today is we prepared a session on mitigating interpersonal challenges in small group learning. I appreciate you guys. Oh, okay, is that good? Good, good, good. Can you guys hear me okay? So I appreciate you guys getting kind of into small groups because um, for our small group, uh, our session on small group learning, we intended to build in small groups. And I know the seating is not very optimal for that, but I hope that we can do our best to make it work. So these are our presenters. They're from all over the country and we have roles in UME and GME and simulation leadership and program leadership. So I hope that will be a good representative of how to optimize small group learning. We don't have any disclosures. So we're here today because you're probably interested in making small group learning better. And small group learning is built on this idea that when people learn, they learn by integrating new information to existing framework of how the world works. And in small group, this occurs through discussion. By sharing and uniting ideas, learners can generate listening, questioning, debate, analysis, synthesis, just really good critical thinking behaviors. Uh, small group learning has exploded. In medical education, it shows up in settings like simulation or classroom settings like TBO and PBO and case-based learning. And our challenge as medical educators is really to make the best use of that time. So when small group sessions go well, they go really well, right? So learners get to explore different perspectives. They learn how to manage ambiguity. They question their underlying assumptions. They develop teamwork and communication skills. And I wanna point out for all these really good things to happen, small group discussion has to be balanced. So every learner who enters a small group discussion setting has to have a, the confidence that they can share their ideas, their ideas will be heard, their ideas will be taken seriously, and that their ideas will be heard in a non-judgmental forum. And that's a hard goal to achieve, right? Because small group learning can be rife with interpersonal problems. So I wanna see a show of hands. Who here has been in a small group that was awkward? Totally, right? Who's been in a small group that was contentious? Yeah, yeah, that happens once in a while, right? And who's been in a small group one of these people? So, you know, um, this is pulled from a medical teacher article. It describes some of the personalities that can show up and make small groups challenging. I, I don't know how I feel about some of this because I don't know how I feel about calling someone a dumb, insolent student, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Psychological safety. Um, but, you know, um, I think that we have probably experienced being around someone like this before, right? Like a social loafer who rides on other people's work, or maybe someone who is aggressive and argumentative or a know-it-all, or someone who doesn't show up to anything that's not mandatory. But I think the most common problem we deal with in small groups by far is the person who is overly quiet or the person who is overly talkative. And the issue with this is that when voices dominate or voices are not heard, in a discussion when it's not balanced, a lot of those benefits of small group learning are lost. So I, I think that there's a lot of educator development on how to improve the small group learning experience, but I think it tends to focus on this step. And it tends to focus a lot on in the moment strategies, like, oh, if you have a quiet person, you know, call on them. Or if you have a talkative person, you can make them describe. But I, I think that I would reframe small group learning as taking place within an interconnected system in which learners arrive at this educational setting and they have this, these pre-existing attitudes and beliefs and personality traits and previous educational experiences that really shape how they communicate with each other. And in this setting, facilitators serve as the representative of a broad, broader knowledge base, um, influencing the way learners generate and synthesize ideas. And based on this model, educators actually have a few distinct opportunities for improving the small group experience as a whole. So they can influence learner-learner interactions, how learners are primed to engage in balanced discussion. They can influence educated learner interactions. They can um, influence how educators facilitate balanced discussion. And they can also influence learning design, how the small group as a whole is designed to promote balanced discussion. And by considering all these factors in a holistic way, educators have an opportunity to think about and mitigate and anticipate those interpersonal challenges in advance. So what we're gonna do today, our goal today in this 50 minute session is to talk about some of these different angles by which you can improve your next small group learning experience. So you're sitting with workshop facilitators kind of close to you guys. And what I think we're gonna do is we're gonna make everyone over here a small group and everyone over here a small group. Um, the, uh, those of you who are gonna facilitate those, those are, hi Nathan, how are you doing? 
Nathan was our AV guy yesterday at our workshop. Thank you so much for being here, Nathan. Um, so um, 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 Lars and Vivian, would you guys raise your hands real quick? And then over here, Glenn and Mike, would you guys raise your hands? So those guys are gonna be your small group facilitators. And we're gonna to transition to a small group discussion, first where we talk about learner-learner interactions, and maybe how some of the ways that learners can be primed to uh, 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 participate in balanced discussion. After that, we're gonna go through some a bit of a transition talk, and then we're gonna think about educator learner interactions and learning design. And then we'll have a quick wrap up with resource sharing. So I'm going to pause here and let us go into our first small group discussion. And thank you so much for working with the suboptimal seating guys. I, I really appreciate it. All right, guys, thank you. So. I'm going to get us going to the next part of our workshop just to um, try to make sure that we end on time because I'm very serious about getting us ending on time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I hope you guys had great discussions. I hope that one thing that this, this discussion illustrates is that when we enter the learning environment, we have a range of thoughts, perspectives, feelings about what constitutes effective small group learning. And this is no surprise, right? Because identity is complex, it's multifaceted, it's influenced very heavily by our prior experiences. And you know, just as people have social identities, learners have learner identities that affect their behavior in different educational environments. And this translates into decisions about how they act in different settings. So to prepare learners for small group discussion, it can be helpful sometimes for them to explicitly talk about this. You know, what, what do you consider a good discussion? How do you behave in the small group? How do you expect others to behave in the small group? Depending on the identity of the group members, these answers might actually have different questions. And it can be helpful to explicitly illuminate this and use this as a strategy for learners to set ground rules for their discussions with each other. So I'm hoping that by having your discussions, you have some insight into this and you have established some uh, loose ground rules for how you engage in the next small group activity. So we're now gonna focus on other parts of this interconnected system for small group learning. Again, it's a real challenge to facilitate balanced discussion in a group of different people with different perspectives. And we're gonna talk about how, how can educators work with learners of all sorts of different backgrounds to rebalance discussion? And how can the small group session itself be designed to encourage balanced discussion. And I'm gonna pause here. We're gonna go into a second small group discussion. We're gonna give this one about 20 minutes or so, and I'll, 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 um, I'll give you a cue to wrap up, and then we'll do some wrap-up slides at the end. Okay. All right, guys. I'm gonna start wrapping this up just so that we can all get out on time, because we wanna, I, are, is anyone going to the nine o'clock thing? Yeah. Are you guys all like ambitious early morning people? So not me, is, is that the, that, that seems like the vibe in this group. You guys are all caffeinated and ready to go. So um, I hope that you guys had interesting discussions in your groups. I hope that this helped to let you think about some strategies about how to design and implement your next small group session at your institutions. I wanna spend a few minutes wrapping things up and also talking through some strategies that we as a group think might be useful to you as you think about your next small group learning session. I wanna point out that on the sheets I handed out, on the back side, on side B, there's like a QR code and it's gonna to link to a lot of the resources that I'm gonna highlight in this part of the session. So I'm gonna go through it a little bit lightning fast, but you can always go to that QR code and look at that Google Doc thingy and look at those resources. So um, I hope that one takeaway you guys get from this is that when the learner arrives to the educational setting, they arrive with this pre-existing identity and it's based on their prior experiences and their you know, uh, in, in, innate personality traits. And this is something I think we really need to embrace as educators to make learning useful for everyone. And to create a balanced small group discussion in which everyone of any communication affinity contributes to and everyone has heard, we have a few distinct strategies. So let's talk by, about learner-learner interactions. Uh, we, we know that communication doesn't exactly come with a user manual, right? It, it's really hard to bring together a separate group of people and have them communicate effectively with each other. We know that from the clinical setting. We know that from the classroom setting. We know this. So, you know, it may be worthwhile for learner groups to set ground rules for themselves, to agree on the types of behavior they think are optimal for creating a safe forum for speaking and being heard. And it could be worthwhile to provide direct training on these skills. As educators, we go through all sorts of training, right? We go through simulation facilitation training and debriefing training and clinical bedside teaching training and small group facilitation training. Well, you know, maybe learners could benefit on direct training for how to be effective small group members. This might be something that could really help them take that step to work well in teams. Um, let's talk about setting expectations for small group discussion. I, I think that we're very lucky 
as medical educators because I think that compared to many other educational settings, our trainees, they are very, 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 they work very hard to meet our expectations. We're very lucky as medical educators. And the expectation to set in small group learning is that the discussion is the point. The discussion is where learning takes place. The discussion is the core of the educational experience. And I think that if we set that expectation, because we are very lucky to have this great learner group, they will meet that expectation. So if this is highlighted to learners as part of their input of the session, their behavior will change because again, they want to meet that expectation. Let's talk about peer feedback. So I work in mostly a UME setting. We do a lot of TBL, where students are in stable groups throughout the semester. And we actually obtain anonymized and formative peer feedback for teams of students. And we get this halfway through the semester. We get this at the end of the semester. And it can feel awkward, but you know, my experience is this honestly does more good than harm. And you know, I, I think that we all understand that we don't see what we don't see, right? And I think that a lot of people, if it's framed to them in the right way, with the right growth mindset, with the right environment, with the right supports, they welcome an opportunity to do better. So this is an example of a very structured example of peer feedback that's been like validated and blah, blah, blah. But at my institution, our peer feedback form is just two questions. Open-ended, fill in the blank, they fill it up for every other student in their group, and they get it at the midpoint at the end of the semester. Let's talk about educator and learner interactions. So what can educators do during a session to promote balanced discussion? I, I think a lot of this is about positive and negative reinforcement. Because if you have a group of learners who agree that balanced discussion is the point of a small group session, they agree on ground rules for discussion, well, hey, you have an opportunity to reinforce that, right, as facilitators. So when you see really good discussion behaviors, when you see them questioning, analyzing, synthesizing really great critical thinking, you can possibly reinforce that. You can say, hey, you know, I really like how you brought together this person's point and this person's point, and you integrated that with a pre-reading, and you came up with this cool idea. That's a great job. Right? Or, you know, you can do negative reinforcement, like, you know, hey, Tina, um, that sounds like a great idea, but one of the things that we agreed on was we're going to let everyone talk during the brainstorming stage, and then we're going to vet ideas. So I like that thought, but let's pause it until everyone's had a chance to speak. So, and, uh, you know, and um, as long as those ground rules are defined and those goals and objectives are defined, there's this opportunity for reinforcement. And then I think I heard a lot of you guys talking about specific discussion techniques that you can use to encourage people to talk, to encourage people to participate, to provoke thoughtful discussion, and better explore learners' thought processes. Um, let's talk a bit about uh, feedback. So if we believe in peer feedback for learners, maybe there should be some sort of feedback mechanism for educators, right? This is an example of a questionnaire that learners can submit at the end of a small group session to give feedback on which parts went well, and which parts didn't go quite so well. And you know, again, feedback is challenging, it can be, among other things, it can be, at the very least, logistically cumbersome, right? But I think that there, there's value in having that kind of mechanism for getting genuine feedback on how you're doing as a facilitator and facilitating a small group session. Let's talk about learning design. So there's some strategies here, too. So one major strategy is to use collaborative learning techniques, which can be used to structure small group discussion so that everyone has a more equal opportunity to provide input and unite their contributions with others. During our session, we use think, pair, share, and we use buzz groups. These are examples of collaborative learning techniques. And the goal here is that it's not a magic bullet, but you know, the goal here is that it can smooth out some of the intrinsic imbalance that occurs when people of different communication affinities cluster together. And you know, I think it's worthwhile too to remember that when you're designing a small group discussion, again, the discussion is the point. Pre-work and other inputs, they should be chosen to support the discussion, not the other way around. And you know, to highlight this, one strategy is it can be valuable to require a product from the discussion that learners cannot achieve alone. So for example, you know, instead of having learners read like a journal article and then show up and just recap points from the journal article, maybe they should consider the article's implications in various clinical environments with various resources, or maybe they should reconcile the article's recommendations with their own personal clinical experiences. But I think that by redesigning the experience to make it so that learners must cooperate with each other to reach the activity's goal, that's one way to make the small group experience worthwhile and to promote the behaviors that you're hoping to see in small group discussion. So we hope you enjoy the session. Thank you so much for being such a great group at 8 in the morning. Um, stay cool out there. Phoenix is really hot. If you're interested in some of the resources we use to construct this workshop, we have that QR code on the back of the sheet, and here's also a link to that Google Doc. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.